Hi, I'm Steve from SF Marine and in front of me today is the Ocean 4.2. Now Ocean Ribs is a new client of ours and all their moulds are now on site and we're starting to put these in for production. So this is a 4.2 metre rib that we'll be looking to install with a 40 horsepower outboard and carbon white tubes. You can head over to their Facebook page, Ocean Ribs Limited, uh, as well as their website to see the demo rib that they've just released that is currently up for sale uh, that you can pick up for £15,000. Um, that's on an extreme trailer with a 40 horsepower Suzuki. So running through this, as like any mould, we've brought this in, it's not been used in a little while, uh, so we're going over with a polish. So this is a deep cutting compound just to sort of rejuvenate a bit of the gel, get a bit of shine back to it and take off any oxidisation, any dirt, grease and grime that may have built up since it's not been used. So this hole is a nice little hole, um, you know, relatively deep V on it as well. We've got a little flat spot on the kill there, which will help with some lift uh, with the water flow. Just because of the weight of the engine, this boat doesn't exactly displace huge amounts of water. Uh, so all little things like that will aid in getting you on the plane and, and a bit of control as well. Okay, so as I say, we're running over the polish now. Um, just give it a bit more of a polish and a tidy up. And then we can start going in with the mould release wax. So the mould release wax, again, uh, we use a beeswax or honey beeswax. You know, there's a few different products on the market, depending on, <clears throat> as in our previous videos, the temperature that we're working in. Um, yeah, so I'll give it a little polish, see what we do here, and then later on we'll progress into waxing it. So on the polisher, we just use a lamb's wool polishing head. I've got a Dewalt polisher. Now this polisher is, it's a nice polisher, it's heavy duty, um, but that, that is exactly, it isn't the lightest thing on the market. Um, so it will build up your arms, so just look at it as exercise rather than using something smaller and lighter. Uh, at least it gives you a bit of weight behind it as well to get some pressure on the pad to polish the surface. Um, and then just try and change these over. So these lamb wool pads, some of them have uh, like red stitching or, or different kind of stitching inside. Once that begins to show on the pad, you really need to start looking at changing it because although it starts off very nice and fluffy, um, because of the high temperatures that these can get to, they tend to tear away the wool itself uh, and then wear down over time. And then it's not doing its job properly. Okay, so I've, I've mostly compounded this side anyway. So at a low speed, we start at a low speed to cut. So it's more like massaging the gel coat with a nice low speed and the cutting compound to really try and dig into that. Once we've done that, we go over and slowly increase the speed as you're doing it. And then what this does is it warms up the mould, it also warms up the cutting compound and as the cutting compound warms up and dries, the centrifugal motion of the polisher will throw the polishing compound away. So what you can see is the cut is the more flat when you're using the polisher nice and flat and then you polish it up anyway and then what you can do is start to use the side or, or the quarter of the polishing pad at more of an angle and then what this would do is buff it. So you know, so you've got your, your low speed massage and cut, then your high speed to get rid of the residue and then obviously a, a, a buffy polish at the end as well. Okay, so I'll just show you now what I'll do in a quick little short bit just to show what we're doing with the polisher. Okay, so again, checking my speeds on low slow.
Okay, so something like that. There'll be a little bit of residue left. Now you needn't worry, it's not the end of the world. Because when you go to put the first wax on, the first wax will pick up any little residue, will last little bits. Sometimes we'll get a clean rag and then go into these deep little pockets and shards because this is where the compound's going to collect. Um, and then obviously at the end of the day, if it stays in there, you wax over the top of it and pull the component out of the mould, it will stick into it. Okay, so just make sure you're nice and thorough anyway. Really at this point, you don't want to go in with any more water once you're done because it all needs to be dried out before the wax goes in, otherwise it is going to cause you problems. Okay, so keep watching, we'll do a bit more and then we'll move on to the next stage. So now with the hull polished, I've gone over with a dry rag to finish off. So there's no moisture or water residue left on the mould now. Some of the polishing stains can be a little bit more stubborn than others. Um, so sometimes if you can't brush them off with a dry rag, is get a squirty bottle, um, you know, something that you buy at a garden centre for a pound, and just give it a light mist, and then this will just soak into any remaining cutting compound that's on the surface, and it'll just make it a little bit easier to break up so that you can wipe it off. Because now we're gonna start going on with the wax. Any residue that's left, this in reality is gonna encapsulate it between the wax layer and the mould. So the cleaner the mould is now, um, the better it is. Now, if there's some light dust residue, which there is in this case, it's not the end of the world. Yes, I could attack this with a uh, micro a wax cloth now, but the reality of it is, is we work in a fold glass workshop and there's dust in the air all the time. It will just reset another mould, um, so why waste the time, energy and money on buying and using these other things when at the end we're gonna do it all again anyway. Okay, so now I've just got an offcut of a rag that we buy in our large rack bags. Some of these pots come with um, applicators, they'll be sponge. They last about two minutes. They're not the best uh, applicator out there. They may be for nice, flat, easy surfaces, but where we're working on complicated shapes and moulds, such as chines, or we've got these harder edges on the outside of the moulds, is they catch and they just break down pretty quickly. Okay, so the thing is with this now is when applying the wax, you've really got two options going forward. Is either you apply a heavy, thick coat, which one, takes longer to cure, two, is harder to get off, and three, uses more wax than actually necessary. Okay, so I'll only use a small amount on here at a time. And really, you want to try and spread this um, as not as thin as possible. So what you've got to look at is a consistent coat, but a consistent thin coat. So over time, you'll train your eyes to see what you're looking for and things like this. So just same, you know, wax on, wax off style, just circles, things like that. And then what I can do is I can use the light, I can use the lights above me, I can use the lights that are in the workshop to, to reflect off of the surface. And, and if you catch the light, you'll see. And you'll see breaks, so there'll be clean areas in this. And if there are clean areas, and obviously they are areas you've missed, so in reality you just need to go over them again. Um, I try not to put too much on, just because it's just, like I say, it's a pain to get off. Um, long term. This again is a high temperature wax, so the high temperature wax that we're using now um, cures pretty quickly as opposed to the standard like a mirror glaze wax that we used before. It's only because if I, was using, if I was doing other things right now then I may use a wax that takes a little bit longer to go off because I'm pretty much on this for the day. Um, by the time I get to the other end in reality, the first bit should have gone off and I could just move along and just keep working round and round and round and round and round. So applicating this, we really want to look at the applying between six to eight coats of this mold release wax. You know, make sure we get in all these tight little corners and things like that. Just break any remaining bits of polishing compound because you know, you should have cleaned it by now. So it should just be polishing compound left in these little corners. Okay, and so we'll just look back down, using the light to reflect off the surface, and then I can see anywhere I've missed, anything that needs touching up. And again, the reason why we're doing so many coats is for that reason. But if there is a small spot that I've missed, the likelihood is I'm not gonna miss it six or eight times. And if I do, then I shouldn't be a boat builder, I should be a magician. Okay. So, going back to one of our other videos, we talk about flashing off and things like this. It shouldn't take too long to flash off at all, especially in the temperatures we are now. We are almost, well, really in the peak of British summertime. 
which means we call it summer, but it still just rains every day, and we pretend it doesn't just to make ourselves feel a little bit better about it. Okay, so releasing these, got to make sure there's definitely enough wax in these corners. Because this is a complex shape, the surface tension that's created on a deep chine, you know, then uh, what will happen is that's where the mould's going to most likely grip. Big flat surfaces are pretty easy to break off. These tight complex corners are more difficult. The more complicated the shape, the more likely it is to want to stay in the mould and not come out. Because it's all about creating that pressure when we go to release to get in that flange and release it from the boat itself. Okay, so that's pretty much this side done. I'll check over it again, get the transom done on the other side. Repeat this process another six times after polishing it, and even for polishing it, we just want a dry rag. Again, we used um, like kilo, 20 kilo bags of rags because they're cheap, they're disposable. Once the rags clog up with wax that you've polished off, is they become pretty useless other than cleaning up a mess off the floor because you've dropped some resin or uh, you've tripped on something. So. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll show you a bit of polishing off in a minute, but it's pretty much the same as what you're doing now. You put it on, you let this dry, you polish the wax off, repeat, repeat, repeat. And then once that's done, these little holes, so these holes can be used for pushing air lines in to release the component from the inside. And so we'll just use some beeswax putty and clean them off and flush them off as well. So when it releases, There'll be like a little nipple as such of, of beeswax on the bottom of the hull. Um, but if we get that nice and tidy of a razor blade when we trim it, then that way it's going to be the smallest blemish as possible on the bottom that needs repairing. And I have tried other things in the past, so obviously it's trial and errors. Thinking you'll try something new and we use vinyl stickers, and because vinyl stickers is a you know it's a, it's a stretchy polyester or polyester-based product as well, is that it warps. So one, it's sort of released from around, um, and then actually the heat, the exothermic reaction from the gel coat and the resin pushed the sticker through the hole and then we ended up with high spots on the bottom of the hole that needed additional work. So I definitely suggest beeswax with that and that's why if you build a mould out of melamine or something like that as well, then you'll definitely be using beeswax. So you can, you go to Hobbycraft and buy plasticine. Don't always advise plasticine, it is, it is okay, but it's cheap, but it's usable. It's really hard to work with, you have to get it really warm and it does leave a lot of residue. Um, on the surface as well when you come out, especially if you use the coloured one. So if you're building a white boat and you put a red beeswax on it, then what will happen is the pigment in the plasticine will soak into the gel coat um, and then you'll end up again having to spend more time repairing. Okay, so I'm gonna get on with the other side, finish off the transom um, and then we'll start polishing off. Okay, and as if by magic, the waxing's done. So now we're going to move on to the gel coat, okay, so I've already catalyzed the gel coat here. You really want to try and catalyze your gel coat at 2%. Anything less could be a bit sketchy. If you go down to one, you know, there's, there's a chance that some bits may not go off if it's not been mixed properly, things like this. So I've actually gone for just shy of two because I am on my own doing this is only a small component, but it's a bit larger than, say, you know, a seat box or something like that. So, the morphology behind all this really is just to, you know, it's just try to keep some structure in what you're doing. Even when it comes to the whole layout, what we'll end up doing is uh, building the boat from the transom, the back of the boat, and working our way forward. So, this just gives me bit of structure of the process of what I'm doing that you're keeping the consistency in the way you're going about it <clears throat> and obviously I'll start at the lowest point first and work my way out because I end up leaning across it and then I don't really want a sticky tummy okay so you can use uh, like a gloss roller as well to Get the thickness on because it gets the gel on quicker and then you'll smooth it out with a brush afterwards. Um, it really depends on what way you find more comfortable to do. And I'll do a bit of both, it sort of depends on 
the component itself and just because this is the first one for me it's uh just want to make sure I, I definitely know that i'll get a much thicker base coat on with a brush um, it takes a little bit longer so if you're a novice it can be a bit tricky because sometimes the gel can go off before you get to the end of it just where you're not coating it on quick enough okay so we're just going in with the basic white that we use on all our boats and again one thing to remember is although you can buy the same colour or the same name, the same code as such in white is it really comes down to the batch as well so if I was to paint this now in a year's time if I was to go back to the same company and buy another can of this white it may not be the same and then when it goes to repair a vessel be it a chip or you know a bit of pre-release or anything really that needs touching up is you may be able to see it so when you're building something is always right the um, the boat that you're building on one can and just try and keep a little bit left so that way if anything does happen you know pre-release or a bit of warp or a bit of shrinkage because you know what have gone off too quick the reaction's not quite gone how you wanted it to which these things do happen you know it's not a uh, <laughs> it is an exact science to, to a degree at the end of the day we are working with chemicals um, but you know there are some things that can happen that you don't account for and it might always be your fault because it's been that there was um, you know uh, the, the, the mould got knocked or the thermal reaction exothermic reaction cured a little bit too quickly and there's a little bit of shrinkage and um, you know the mould gets you really don't want to be moving the roll around once this is done because um, it might pre-release because it's quite a thin mould. It sometimes works in your favour, sometimes it doesn't. That You don't want to end up knocking something and then the boat being pre-released out of the mould and then when you go to put the main layup in it causes more problems because the thin gel and first layer of fiberglass has detached from the mould then warps and then evidently causes you more problems down the line so you know so really like I say you just want to make sure you get it on nice and thick the one thing with this look like we said before is, is really try and not just spread it out but you know you just it's the consistency of it gravity doesn't always work in your favour well it definitely doesn't when it comes to building boats so if I have a big lump of it a big pile here this gravity is going to want to make it run down the boat here so at this point I'll go left to right because I'm following the shape of the hull so the spreading is going to be much easier than me going duh, 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 up and down that way yeah it's spreading it this way so when you've got more vertical surface I've got a mono hull that's coming up here there's always brush up because if you brush vertically then you don't end up with the drips and the runs whereas if you brush horizontally you will do and um, especially if it's a bit thicker so you just got to be mindful of that because Again, this is the most important part of it all, that if you don't end up with a nice smooth gel and you end up with ridges and runs and bulbous areas, then when you go to put the mat on, that'll actually cause you more issues um, because the mat won't lay into that type of, you know, like a, like a drip, it won't tuck into here, so it causes a bubble. The bubble then causes you to have to dig it out and repair it and do it again before you progress forward. So, you know, the nicer you can get it, the smoother the gel. And although the coverage looks nice now, is you still still be able to see through this as such if you were to pull it out of the mould as is. Um, and even when you do two gels and the glass, uh, you can actually see through the components still in some cases. Um, and you know, it, but it, once you get the lockers and everything painted inside, it's, you, it's the likelihood of it being seen runs well gets a lot, lot smaller because at the end of the day this is just a clear gel coat with a pigment running through it so it's to be expected that even if it's you know moderately thick you still may end up with um, thin areas on it so it's just to be mindful 
as you may see more than I can on these back chines, which there's some up there, is to double check in these. This is what I'd usually do is run around the other side. Or if you're working in a team of two, you send your partner around and go, where's Mist, where's Finn? And then they'll tell you up, down, lefty, righty. And that way you can get uh, all the coverage, as much coverage as you're wanting on this anyway. So yeah, it's a bit of a lengthy process at times, and you know, it doesn't take ages, but the curing process, you wanna try and get this off if you can in the first day. If you get this off in the first day, <coughs> you want two on and the first coat to try and get done in the first day so that you can move on with the main hull layout afterwards. Again, we're always over catalyzing because if, well not over catalyzing, but catalyzing well enough, you get about two days, really, of play time, shall we say. But if you have under catalyzed, if it hasn't gone off by the second day, then the look here it is, you're in a bit of trouble by that point. So, you know, it's just a bit of trial and error and getting used to the whole process as it is. And find what works for you, because everyone's different. Everyone works at different paces. Everyone works in slightly different ways and ways they're understanding, but we're all human at the end of the day, so. Just see what works for you and you usually if you're working in twos you get used to how each other work and well same as any industry is you can understand what someone wants without having to ask them because you both know the process you both know each other and how each other work that you know what works and what don't and what, what needs doing so we should have time today to get both of these on anyway and once we do we let that cure overnight the second coat and assist in the first coat going off. It wants to be tacky, you know. This, this, because it's a gel coat with no wax in it, always remains tacky anyway. I mean, tacky in the sense of it's not wet, but you know, it's, it, well, it's tacky, is what it is. Uh, so it'll be hard, but it'll have just maybe a little bit of a soft film on top in some places. But if it goes off well enough, you, you mostly get rid of that altogether anyway. And then once you've got those two in, these cheap brushes, see, they just throw away, but they drop hairs. Is, um, we'll get the mat sorted out for the first layer. So, same as anything, we start with a isophallic layer on this, which is resistant to water, you know, resistance to fire, and a lot of other things. Oh, bugs love this as well. So flies, insects, they love the smell of styrene. So you often come in the following day and you're picking out a whole army of insects that have decided to take up refuge in your gel coat. So if you are new to this, I probably would suggest um, wearing a mask or some sort of breathing apparatus that's going to suit you, especially if you're in somewhere like your garage or anything like that, because the more ventilated it is, the better. Styrene is actually a, or well, styrene, which is a gas produced by this gel coat, is a heavy gas, okay, so it doesn't float up, it's not like helium, helium is a light gas, helium floats. Styrene is a heavy gas and therefore it sinks. So when you're making components like this as well, <coughs> it's currently a bulb. You know, we're working in what is, you know, a giant fruit bowl, really. And uh, what will happen is the styrene will settle below the lowest point of this, which is at the transom, and it will sit there, and it will sit there, and it will sit there. And then what you'll realise is the top bits that can breathe, i.e. this lip and the top few inches, will go hard quicker, and it will go off. The styrene slows the process and slows the reaction, and therefore won't allow the gel coat to go off correctly. So what you need to do is, I mean it doesn't take much, even if it's a fan, you know once you're finished, even if it's a fan, you know a lot of guys use a compressor with a airline on it and then that will just be, you know, just blow it into the mould and then that way you just blow all the styrene out into the atmosphere um, or you know the rest of the floor and it will cure the gel coat quicker that's in the base of the, the mould. 
Okay, so if you're looking or haven't got or can't afford the compressor, it doesn't matter because you could use other things. Even wafting it with a piece of cardboard will disturb the air and aerate the mould. You, know, you could use a hooper or you could use, as I say, a household fan or really anything. You just need to move the air from inside the mould and swap it out with some fresh air. And, and, and I'd usually do that a few times before the uh, curing process is completed because it carries on producing styrene even after you do that, that, that you just need to make sure that it's all out and that it's nice and nice and clean for you. Another hair. So you come I in, you can buy very expensive brushes for this sort of stuff, but it's not like you're a decorator, you know, painting this is a pain in the ass and to keep your brush super clean only takes you that one time of you forgetting or the gel coat catching you up and going off a little bit quicker than you anticipated, uh, th th then your brush is gone. So then you've just wasted whatever, 5 99 on a brush, or you've just bought one for a pound and you put it in the bin in the business. It's all about production, so what's worth more? My time to sit there and clean that brush out for a pound, or work for another hour and buy X amount of new brushes. Okay, so this is this side pretty much done now, as you can see. So I'm just going to turn the camera off, I'll get on with the other side, and then I'll carry on a bit later. So now we've done the two gel coats in the mould, okay, so we're going to start with the first layer of the fiberglass. So I've already cut this piece to size. This is a single piece here, this is 300 gram chopped strand mat. So you may be familiar. If you've ever done a repair before or seen types of fiberglass, there's different weights, different ratios and, and different uh, systems uh, for different uses. So because this is the first layer, we want a nice, easy, malleable mat. Now the 300 gram is one of the thinnest, other than tissue mat, the thinnest that you're going to get, okay? So I've put this in, as you can see, it goes from the side of the flange here, down into the centre of the keel, and then up the other side. So in any boat, the keel is the strongest point, okay? That needs to be twice as thick as anything else that is happening on the boat. So you'll always have a double overlap in the keel because it is the spinal cord of the vessel. If that is the weakest point, then it's gonna be the first thing to break when you decide to go wave jumping with your mates after a few tinnies. Okay, so we'll put that in and because Matt doesn't like to move too easily or you know it'll overlap and crease as such so up the bow here i'll put tears in okay tear 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 so then that way it sits into the stem nice and tightly it'll overlap into itself as well which will make um, the lamination process a lot easier so again a nice healthy bit up the bow here so again because of that it's nice and strong it's the first thing that's going to be punching into that wave so therefore you want it nice and strong if it's too thin what will happen is the stem will flex up and eventually you'll end up with stress fractures or potential breakage around here just um, after the bow or, or you know the bow quarter as such okay so now that's all torn in, this will stretch nicely into these chines and we'll feed it into these chines a little bit better anyway, so that will just sit in there nice and tightly, okay? So the isophallic resin we're going to use, so the isophallic resin, why do we use isophallic and what is it? So the iso resin is a uh, water resistant, uh, flame resistant or heat resistant uh, resin, so it can be used with polyester, um, it can also, or well, what is actually similar to is vinyl ester. So isophallic and vinyl ester are two similar products, okay? The vinyl ester is slightly harder, um, it does take a little bit more to get it to go off, um, and, you know, it, it really depends on what you want to use. I've, I've worked with people who use vinyl ester resin, I've worked with people who use isophallic resin. I prefer isophallic, it's easier to work with. Uh, vinyl ester can be quite thick and gloopy and harder to soak into the mat, especially the way mat has gone these days, okay? So, not even eons ago, say five, ten years ago, mat was much higher quality, timber was much higher quality. Now a lot of the mat, a lot of the timber, a lot of things that they're coming from uh, fast grown woodlands in China, in Malaysia, in Vietnam, in Turkey, um, you know, all these products are coming from Europe and Asia, and so, they're more mass produced, uh, it's just we can't get them at the same cost as we used to be able to. So because of that we have to work with what we've got, okay. So 
<clears throat> this mat is a little bit more expensive than some of the cheaper ones out there, but I like it because um, I can work with it. That's the thing, is otherwise it just becomes very difficult. And when you're in the process of building something of this size or you know, any size really, is really you want the quickest soak as possible to get that resin into the mat so that you can work it, so you can beat it, so you can move on to the next section, obviously go home on time. Okay, so we're gonna rip this back out of here. Well, well let me rip it out of here. We'll take it back out of here, um, we we'll check over. So the other thing I did before I put this in, just ran my hand over all the gel coat. So as I say, it's slightly tacky. I can hear it, the mat's slightly tacked to it, which is what you want. And if there's any what I call bogies or, or high spots or spikies or, or bits of gel that have um, either gone hard and ended up in the mix, um, you know, from the bucket or cured slightly too quick, or maybe there's just a little high spot, it's really, you want to knock those down and out. Again, because of that, if you've got a mountain and you're putting something over the top of it, what will happen is you'll end up with an air ring around that item and then it will need to be repaired, okay? If any come up, um, I'll take them out and show you. If you look at some of my previous videos, um, you can see some bits in there as well, okay? So, we'll take this out now, we'll get the isophallic resin ready, we'll get all the tools ready, uh, and then we'll take you through the process of laminating uh, a side of the hut, okay? Okay, so let's get to it. So, the isophallic resin, same consistency, like I say, as polyester resin. A bit more blue. You can tell the difference visually. Wireless is quite brown. Obviously, fun, it's quite blue. Polyester is sort of a pinky colour. Okay. So you want to wet the surface first. Now, I'm only using a four-inch fluffy roller on this. Now, you can use a four-inch, you can use a seven-inch. Really use whatever you like. Uh, really just because it's a smaller component of getting a very large roller in these chines to make sure it's nice and saturated and wet. A little bit more difficult. Um, again, really, from the scale of stuff that I normally work on, this is not massive, so smaller components, I tend to use a smaller roller for them as well. Okay, so wet up. So the reason we wet it up first is because we want to get resin beneath the mat. Get resin beneath the mat so that even if you wet the top of the mat, which is what we're going to do afterwards, it will soak in and create a bond between the top of the gel coat and the underside of the mat that you're putting in there. You do this because if you do not, there is a high likelihood that your mat will remain dry on the underside. And if it remains dry on the underside, you can actually detach glass from the gel, almost scalp it, uh, which will obviously in turn cause you more problems down the line. So make sure it's nice and wet. I folded it back because at least it's staying in the same position now. I can just fold it over. It's going to sit where I need it to and then that way I'm not fighting a large piece of mat to do and try and get it in position because uh, obviously it does work like a glue as well but once it starts to contact it does uh, become more difficult to move around and play with okay so i'll try and bed these chines in first because while the mat is still loose on the other side of this chine it'll actually pull that slack into the edge with it as opposed to doing it flat and then stretching it in is what that will do will uh, make the chines thinner. It will have a thinner layer of mat on there. But, uh, you know, not the end of the world, but uh, you, you want it nice and strong. And while we do this, and you see a lot of the Australians and Americans and things like this, they use chopper guns. In the UK, it can be done, it can be used, um, even from my point of view. Unless you're really good at it. I'll frown on it a little bit just because the consistency is not there. You know, this is made by a machine. We know that it's 300 gram, and therefore one sheet I put in is 300 gram with a chopper gun. It's more difficult because you can't tell. You're just looking at it, thinking you're putting enough on, thinking you're layering it the way you want to layer it, and there could be high spots, there could be low spots. Especially when you start getting into the commercial side of things that these commercial surveyors and things really frown upon it because they've got nothing to gauge off of. You know, they've got no way of telling how good your layup is without drilling a hole in it. 
um, and checking the thickness in multiple spots, but obviously it's a bit counterproductive at that point because you've then got holes in the boat, which no one really wants. Okay, so we just wet, it, wet everything up first. To make your life easier, it's really just allow the mat and the resin to do a lot of the work for you. Okay, so the longer the mat and resin sit with one another, the longer it soaks. The longer it soaks, the more malleable it becomes. The more malleable it becomes, the less you're having to fight it all the time to get it to go. So now you might see whether the camera's picking it up or not, is that the resin is changing hue, so it starts off as blue. Okay, because that's the colour that comes out of the tub. As it catalyzes and cures slowly, well, slowly enough, it will start to change colour, like what we've got going on here. And it can go green, which is what it's doing, and then it will sort of settle off a sort of beigey buff. A bit of a browny hue. So I've got a couple of styles of paddle on it. Okay. But this is a washer roller. I've actually taken a couple of washers off of it. No one seems to like this but me because it moves around but it also allows a bit more movement. I've also got a wheel roller. Okay, So this one is good for getting in them tight little corners in those chines and really making sure that mat is bedded in there. Okay, And then this one is good for the nice flat surfaces. You may ask, or you may have a bubble buster roller, okay? You may ask, well, I'm not using a bubble buster. And sometimes they can be counterproductive and put more air in the product than what you're trying to get out of it, okay? Whereas this one pushes the resin through the mat without stabbing holes in the mat as well and creating bubbles. So with this, try and just be methodical the way you're going about things. You know, break it down, look at the shapes, look at the lines, okay? So what we can do is work this single flat face. Once I've done this flat face, I'm not overwhelming myself by trying to take on too much. I'm not missing any spots because I know where I've gone with it, okay? So then that's that one. And then you can move up and you can start working the chine, okay? Up and down and up and down. Work the chine. Start working the air out of there, stretching it in. So the way I consolidate, it really works on a three-stage process in my eyes anyway. First stage is to contact the mat with the product, or if you're multi-layering, is to contact the mat with each other. Okay, so that's your first pass, really. You know, your first pass of your mat is what I'm doing now. Then you're allowing that to soak. The contact has been made between the laminates between the products. After that stage, you'll go back for a second pass. The second pass will remove 90% of the air that you've had in the map or in the lap. Okay, and then the third stage is your quality control stage where you go back over, you check everything, and then this is what this is for now. I've done that, is I'll run this wheel through the chine, okay, and it will stretch. Okay, like a 600 grams powder bonded, so it's glued together or, or stuck together with almost like talcum powder. So it's a bit more difficult, as I'm saying about the different mats. If you would put 600 gram in first, it would prove more difficult to get this stage done because this is a very thin mat, it's nice and stretchy, nice and easy to work with, and therefore makes your life a lot easier. All, all boats are built on good foundations, and a good foundation is that if you can get the gel nice and you can get the first layer nice, then everything else after that will fall into place and you have no issues. You know, at some point there may be a small bubble of air trapped in the main laminate. Of course, over time that could cause an issue, but these are hand built. They're not machine built, so they're not machine engineered, CNC laser formed and all this sort of caper. This is made by a man and some washers on the end of a paint roller. So, you know, sometimes there are expectations and you have to manage your expectations of what, what you can really do and try not to beat yourself up too much about if anything does happen. Because the one thing I've learned over time with fiberglass is that anything's fixable, anything's repairable, what all 
just comes down to is the amount of time it's going to take to put that right. And taking that little bit of extra time now can save you a hell of a lot of hassle down the line. Now there's a lot of outside factors as well. You know, it's not just me here now with what we've got in front of it. It also comes down to humidity, temperature as well. So even though we catalyze this, uh, if it's too hot, then, so the baseline is sort of 15 degrees, okay? If it's hotter than 15 degrees, then your life will become slightly more challenging than if it wasn't, okay? You can also hear this as well. You can hear if there's bubbles in it, you can hear the mat. So what you may find is if it's below 15 degrees, the resin may take longer to go off and really you need to catalyze that 2%. If it's higher, or you're multi-layering, or there's a chance that things are gonna get very hot, then the suggestion is to lower the amount of catalyst you're putting in it. But you have to do this with great care because under catalyzing it will cause issues because the resin may not have been mixed correctly. You know, it may not be warm enough for that mix to go off fast enough. And we talked about the sort of two day window maximum to get things to cure, should something happen. Okay. There's all things to take into consideration. So really, from your standpoint, if you're doing a repair or you're making a little sink mold or you've built a mold out of melamine that you want to lay up, then Try and catalyze at 2%, okay? So, if you're not good at maths, well, not, not that there's ever an issue with that, um, it's just try and make it a bit easier for you. So I weigh everything in kilos, okay? Kilos, one kilo, two kilo, sort of a maximum of 10 kilos. Um, and I'll probably not suggest doing 10 kilos yourself uh, at one time, unless you're pretty bang on with what you can do, okay? So, let's take, for example, one kilo. One kilo will take 20 milliliters of catalyst. That is a 2% ratio. A kilo is the same as a liter. Okay, so if you weigh a liter of liquid, it comes out at one kilo. Okay, pretty simple, yeah? One to one, a liter. A kilo is a liter. And 2% of a kilo is 20 milliliters. So it's not about knowing or understanding the, um, the ratios as such, it's more understanding what numbers go with what? So I know one kilo goes with 20 millilitres, I know that two kilos goes with 40 millilitres. If I want to do it at 1%, then I just half it, okay? So then one kilo will be 10 millilitres, and two kilos will be 20 millilitres. Again, I only do that if I'm multi-layering, because uh, the reaction overall is an exothermic reaction. And what it will do is create heat. The more heat that is created, the faster the product will cure, the faster the product will react. Okay, so that's why. So if you're multi-layering, say you put the three layers at once, you tend to drop the catalyst down to 1% so that you have more working time. Because this is a race against the clock, so to speak. Okay, so then what's always beneficial is once you've sort of done your layout or you're red, is resin tends to sit on the surface. So you get your roller, not sopping, you know, it's just sort of a, might be older bit of resin, it's just run over the product, and this will just flatten off any spiky bits, it will remove any excess resin that's sitting on the surface of the mat, it will give you a better resin to mat ratio, so if you've got too much resin, the construct of what you're building actually becomes weaker, you know, so it's a, they're talking about a 1.8 to one ratio of resin to mat. Uh, and again, to put that in layman's terms is, we'll make it easy for you. If you have a set of scales, whether they be kitchen scales, whether they be sort of farmer market scales, like the more industrious scales, is I tend to weigh out twice the amount of resin than, than mat. Okay, so if it weighs a kilo, the mat weighs a kilo, then it's going to take two kilos of resin to saturate that mat and get it to a good consistency. Now, the correct ratio is actually 1.8. The reason I do two is because 1.8 can sometimes be a bit dry. 
If it's a bit dry, then again, more issues. Whereas if it's a little bit oversaturated and it's uh, you know saturated well, then you're not gonna have any issues in that sense if it is at the end of the day. Yes, like I say, it could be a touch weaker than what uh, would stand up. What would you rather? A nice a dry laminate that when you're doing 40 knots, you could strip the hull from the layer or having it slightly high, especially with this isophallic because, because it's nice and thick. There's a nice protective layer that's going to reduce the effects or, or reduce the chance of osmosis happening on this hull and overall improves the longevity of the product. Okay, so some people do struggle with this, they find it very strenuous in that sort of sense. I mean, once you sort of get used to it, it's, uh, it just becomes a bit of methodology. It's just the process that you undergo to get this product complete. And much like some people are able to switch off and just sort of muddle through it, is, is really what it comes down to for me as well, is that you understand what you need to do. Yes, it can be strenuous, and yes, it can be tired on your body at times, but it's nothing too drastic. You know. Okay, so we've done the first half there, so same again, but it's now, because it's all in location, I can roll back to the second half, like so, and then I can begin to wet up the next half as well, okay? So exactly the same process of what we've done. You now can see that the chines are becoming situated. Again, this will soak for the remainder of its time before it cures. Even at 2%, you've got maybe 20 to 30 minutes of working time. And so if you're worried about that, worried about wasting materials and wasting resin, and just cut things down, and just work with a kilo at a time, or make up multiple buckets of resin prior to you starting, and then afterwards, catalyze them as you go. And then that way, you're only working with a kilo at a time, you're not racing against the clock so much, you've got more work in time, and it overall just makes your life a bit easier. Yes, you've got a little bit of a stop gap between each piece, but it's gonna save you money, save you time, save stressing yourself out, and you know, taking up too much, really. So that's it, that one's wet, so we'll fold that back in. You know, we've got all these little folds again, okay? So that will tuck in there nicely into the keel, nice and flat, fold that down there, deep, and then it sits exactly where I wanted it to in the first place. So I'll put out my layers again there, tuck them in. If you tuck them in and situate them into these deep pockets now, like this stem, then that way, it's not going to be stretching and again making it thinner, like we said with the chimes on the sides as well. Okay. So the other thing about the isophallic, we really only use it, because some, some companies will use it on a, every product. You know, they'll use it on a console, they'll use it on a seat box, they'll use it on everything else. Uh, in reality, a seat box is gonna be out of the water most of all, pretty much all of the time, unless you've uh, hit something. But it doesn't really necessary, because this is more expensive than polyester resin. It's cheap, it's cheaper than epoxy. But it is uh, more expensive than standard polyester resin. So I don't really feel it's necessary to use this on products personally. Under MCA guidelines, the commercial guidelines for building boats and fishing vessels and you know coded work boats and ribs and all this sort of thing, it isn't expected of you. The isophallic first layer is, especially on the hull, just because of the amount of time that's going to be in the water. So, you know, save yourself some pennies. If you're gonna build some of yourself, whether it be a seat box or modify your boat, then probably the best bet for you is just polyester resin, okay? Now, 
For some people, when you may read on the forums or online, they use epoxy. Okay? So the way things work with epoxy is epoxy sticks to anything, but not everything sticks to epoxy. Yes, it sounds counterintuitive that I've just said that, but when it's curing, you can stick polyester on, you can stick epoxy into an polyester, so you can do an epoxy repair. You hit the bottom of your boat on a rock and you're doing a repair. You can repair it with epoxy, yes. You can also repair it in polyester. From my point of view, the boat is usually built in polyester, so therefore why would you not repair it in polyester? If it is a very old boat and the fiberglass is very old, and you've bought a project boat in the back of a marina and you're a bit worried that there's holes in the bottom of it and you just want to make sure that that ain't ever coming off again, that no water's ever going to get in there that, you know, and, and you're never going to have to touch it, then yes, fair enough to epoxy. But if you ever went to do anything on top of that, you can only repair it in epoxy because the polyester will not chemically adhere to what you've done. So it's just something to bear in mind. I personally only repair polyester boats in polyester for that reason, is that they are polyester base, so I'll go and build them or repair them in the same product that they were built with in the first place. Okay, so we've got that on, get a bit in these chines here. Get those chines soaking. A little bit, a bit of stretch from there, nothing too drastic. Bed them in, start getting them working, okay? Some bubbles in the kill there, just give them a bit of a jabby jab. Just get that in there, like I say, first point of contact, get that contact going. If you don't, then it's just going to prolong your time having to pan away with them and beat it up, so to speak. In there. Okay, so that's that. So same again, methodically, section by section, work your way through. Now you'll see is when you're looking at the map, you should see dry spots, you should see wet spots, you should see oversaturation, you should see air bubbles. These things do come with time, you know, don't expect to do it straight away, which is why I say do the three steps. Pad it once, pad it twice, pad it three times. Okay, not quite like that. What I tend to do is small jabs over slowly moving, so I move maybe a centimetre at a time, because then I know I've got maximum consolidation in the product, rather than going one up there, two, that's done, you know. Um, there, there may be chances that there could be air trapped in it still. So this way, small little jabs, and then it just work through. It just gives you a much better consolidation, much better resin saturation in the mat, and then you're not really gonna have any concerns going forward. Okay. So the thing to always look out for is tight little angles. So this little edge up here is quite a sharp little join. And then what will happen, what is happening, is sometimes they can relift because the mat wasn't quite ready for that stage yet to go into a crease that large. Okay, so then just go over and I'll just check these corners again. Okay. And this is your quality control, just making sure that they're all bedded in nicely, that you've got no issues. Now, if you don't always have to chuck more resin on it, you can move resin around ever so slightly into the area that needs. If there's a slight dry spot here, I can roll it into that area and then consolidate, and it will um, soak the mat in, because then that way you're not going to get it, wasting more resin, wasting more material, time, and um, oversaturating the mat too much so that you're going to end up with issues, because that's what really it's about. It all comes down to what the thickness of the product comes out at, and if you're in production, like I am, then every ounce of resin 
is money. So why oversaturate something that isn't necessary when there's plenty of resin there to be used with it anyway? Okay. So you can see this join, it's a nice, nice thick join in the QA. It's going to be uh, nice and strong. So this will, this will double up because obviously the other one on the other side is going to come up to here. So we're going to end up with a really nice, big, fat, strong spine running through this blade. It may only be small, but even uh, Jerry's with their first one at Ocean Ribs, so they uh, put the 40 on there and they were almost doing 40 knots with it. But it's got to be safe. In day. People's lives are in my hands, in the bottom line of it, so why would I not do things properly? It may be overkill, yes, well, it is overkill. Everything I do tends to be overkill, more bigger and stronger than what most do, but it's never going to break. That's, that's what it boils down to. It's never going to break. So when someone's 20 mile offshore in one of your boats, that they got a good chance of survival. Whether they have an impact or whether something happens that you're not gonna have any issues because that's, that's what it comes down to really. It's not everyone is uh, maybe as experienced as you and things like this. You know, it might be their first boat that they've ever bought. So the last thing you want is to be watching the news and to go, oh, there's my boat. I've built that. In reality, it's not a, uh, at that point on BBC News at 10 o'clock in the morning. It ain't the sort of thing you want to be seeing, is it? So, you know, if you're glassing, and even if you're repairing your own boat, it's just taking things into consideration. But, <coughs> you know, try not to cut any corners with it. It's your life. It could be your kids' lives. It could be your friends' lives. And they're they're putting themselves in your hands because you've um, repaired a job or done a job on your boat, you know? So just always be thorough, be vigilant. Even if it's installed in a live bait well and you're just putting a seacock in the bottom of your boat. Just be smart about what you're doing, take the proper precautions and make sure that long term you're proud of what you've done. You're happy with what you've done. You just don't really want anything coming back from you. Okay, so that's that side pretty much done now. A few little bits to finish off at the bow here, just to tidy that up. Get these last little charges done, but there's a nice bit of saturation. Okay, so that's one layer anyway. So we'll do that. We'll get the other side on. So that'll be the first layer, and then we'll move on to doing the polyester main bulk of the rest of the build. Okay, so here we are. We fast forward a little bit here. So this is the main hull lap now complete on this 4.2 ocean, okay? So we went in with the isophallic 300 gram on the first layer, then we followed it with three layers of 600 gram chopped strand mat, and then we went in with a 600 gram, sorry, yeah, a 600 gram woven roving, and then capped it with another 600. So it's not often you'll see a woven on a finished or a cosmetic uh, area as such. Uh, so you always try and trap the woven inside something so that you end up with the matty fiberglass finish that you see here, okay? Um, so these were pretty much done in one run. There's a slight stagger of join here in midship just because of the length of the material and roll we had available, okay? So they went from the outer flange here, rolled in, uh, and actually ended on the other side of the chine here, okay? So from this chine, about two inches up to this chine, this is twice as thick as everything else in the boat. Okay, so going back to what we said before, is, is the spine of the boat, okay? It's gonna be what's gonna be run up the beach when you're taking your missus and your kids out. It's the thing that's gonna be smashing into the waves. It's the thing that may be hitting the rocks, the stones, or anything else that's coming in, um, depending if you're checking out the toppy on the beach and you're not quite looking where you're going. Okay, so, so that's all our structure in there, and that runs right up to the bow here, pretty much all of this section, this whole front section here. 
is also double the thickness. Okay, so it's going to give us a nice strong base to go with. This vessel doesn't actually have um, any longitudinals or bulkheads running through it because it is so small. Once the deck comes in here anyway, the deck will act as our longitudinal stiffness, which will stop the hull, will stop the hull um, wanting to fold up on itself because the deck's going to be giving it that bracing. Now, you know, I guess in older school methods, we're still gonna put timber in this anyway, okay? So this is gonna be a timber deck. One, it gives us the weight we need to keep the vessel down. If this small vessel is too light, um, if you get the wind up the bow, especially with any ribs, you know, I've driven ribs up to eight and a half meters, and if you're going into the wind, coming off of the waves, you, there can be some points where, um, you know, you might need to check your pants once you get back to the dock, uh, just because you've had a couple of hairy moments with it. So it's gonna give us the weight and the ballast we need to keep the boat nice and heavy in the water. And number two, when he goes in, or, or Jerry's gonna come in and, and finish the fit out with this, is he'll have his jockey console, maybe his seat pod, um, or other little cosmetic bits that he's gonna put on there. Um, he's got something to, some more substantial to fix into. So in the UK, when it comes to installing structure, uh, we sort of really only have two options at the moment. Well, actually three, there is three. So you've got your traditional hardwood timber. Yes, yeah, so you want to be buying marine ply. Now, marine ply isn't quite like what it used to be 10, 15 years ago, okay? Um, but regardless, it's what you can get your hands on now uh, without spending a fortune. And even now, you know what timber prices are like. They are phenomenal. Okay, so you've got that as number one. Number two, you've got uh, the composite boards that you see in some of our other builds, which is the Firmahex, um, you know, the, the honeycomb lightweight plastic boards with the, the cotton sheathing on top um, that, that soaks in the mat and becomes a hard rigid board. They're great, they're lightweight, they're no good for fixing into, so you cannot drive screws for them, well you can, but it's not gonna last too long because the only thing that's holding that screw in is the glass, there's no structure, there's no density, there's no stability in that product. Okay, number the three, the third option is these um, lightweight foam core boards. So, you might see big green boards or people using those. Uh, some people put them in their transom. Now I'm old school in that sense, I, I do not like it. If I can squeeze it and I can snap it with my hands, then I do not want to be hanging an engine off at the back of it. And I especially don't want to be hanging two, 400 hours um, off, of, off of that board. I'd rather stick with something that I know, um, which is ply or, or timber, okay? So you can fix into it a little bit better, this, this green um, composite board. Uh, some of it's made out of recycled Sprite bottles, so, but again, you can, some say you can drill and tap it, you can drill and tap it, yes, uh, but the structure of it and the substantial of what, what the core density is, is, in my eyes, not anywhere near the replacement of timber yet. So the only thing, other thing that there is a fourth one that we don't really get over here, which is Kusa board, okay, so the Americans, the Australians, they use something called Kusa board, which is a fiberglass composite board that can be drilled, it can be tapped, it's as dense as timber, and you can sink this baby to the bottom, refloat it, and you can sail away with no issues uh, that there's ever gonna be any rock going into that transom because it's pure, a pure composite fiberglass uh, board, okay. So just to show you this, so the only thing we've got left to do is the transom now, so I'm going to get all the layers on the transom now, and then um, we'll jump back in uh, once we get the transoms uh, laid up, is to show you what we're going to do. Uh, you've seen transom installs before, we're going to show you what we're going to do on this, okay? So we'll start with a small transom install on a rib, um, and you could take this and install it on, you know, your Mary Fisher, Mary Fisher, your, um, your Delkey Dory, your Wilson Flyer, um, your little pilot 520. If you've got anything like that at home or you're working on a project, then you know this, this is a good thing for you to see um, if you're ever in need to replace your transom because it all works the same, it's all the same principles. Okay, so we're moving on to the next couple of stages with this now. We've cut the transom out using the templates that are provided. Okay, so these 18 mil marine grade ply, that's what we spoke about before. So, Jerry and the company has all the templates supplied with the hulls, okay? So, we've got two to go in. It's a four metre boat, we're going to make a 50 mil transom, okay? So, we're going to have eight mil glass plus a ply, a piece of glass, the other ply, and then probably another five, six layers on the inside to cap that off along with the tube carriers as well, okay? So the next thing we're going to do is we need to work out how to get this out of the mould. So I'm one man, um, I'm not Hulk, therefore it's going to be a little bit difficult. Not so much the weight, but more the uh, awkwardness of the shape and size of this. 
So it may sound silly, but we're going to use some cardboard tubes. So these are just off rolls of paper um, that we've had on there anyway. Okay, so we're going to put glass two of these in the boat beneath the deck. They're not going to come out afterwards, they're just going to remain in here. You think why we're using cardboard, so the cardboard is just to give us the shape. Okay, so we're going to glass uh, tabs over the cardboard tubes uh, to create a lifting eye uh, fiberglass out of this, okay? So even though this has um, been laminated, and it's been laminated very recently, it's, it is still pure in, uh, in, in the larger scheme of things, but what we need to do is key this up uh, to give us a nice bond with the fiberglass, okay? So we'll just use a 40 grit piece of sandpaper, like so, okay? Um, and you just want to key up the glass, because all you're doing in reality is in uh, increasing the surface area of the piece here, yeah, because it, every scratch that you put in it is creating a dip, and then overall if you were to measure the surface area of that shape with all the scratches in, it'd actually increase it, so therefore more surface area means better surface tension um, and a better bond as well because what you can do if you were to just laminate directly onto this um, especially if you're looking at doing something like that uh, you could probably not well, we have in the past if there's a lot of weight or a lot of tension on it you can actually rip these out of the boat so you want to really increase your chances of getting a nice bond with this okay so i'm going to put one here towards the back you know thinking about the LCG is such a weight distribution of what this product is going to be. All the weight is going to be Bosch in the back here, because it's where the tracks are. There's nothing on the front, and the deck isn't going to go in until afterwards. Um, so one thing to consider when you're making a mould is twisting, distortion, and things like that. So normally, if we're building um, a larger hull with the 21s, uh, we'd put all the framework in first, so the longitudinals, the bulkheads, uh, all the stiffening, so that way that when the hull comes out of the mould, that you're not going to get any twisting or deformities in it because if you put it on a trolley and it's slightly twisted and then you build everything else in the boat in reality it's just going to go round and round and round in circles okay so what i should have got is a replica or, or another smaller mold as such which is like a dolly so when we take this out we sit it in the dolly the dolly then resets the boat into the shape it wants to sit in um, and then we can carry on construction because then at least at this point we can get the mold the, the hull out of the mold put it on the dolly um, and then install the deck over the top, so we've already got it out and we can finish off the rest of the work that we're going to do on it. Okay, so as I say, four <laughs> of Too happy with that. So you want to clean this out with um, a hoover to begin with because the dust on the surface again is just going to soak into the resin and it pull off. So you need to hoover up the dust. Most of the world, the best uh, best practice is to then clean it with some acetone. Okay, not thinners because it's oily. Yeah, you want acetone, something or, or nail polish remover is what acetone really is. You know. Uh, uh, the same as that, just to clean it off. It'll clean the glass, it'll soften it up, and it'll clean out any dust out of there so that you get a nice bond with it, okay? So we'll get that glass in, we'll put six layers of um, 600 gram drop strand mat over the top of that, and strips gradually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we'll start off at that, and it'll go up and over the tube, and then we'll get wider and wider and wider and wider, okay? Because then all six layers are creating contact with the hull. So you've got your best chance of any structural, same as like we go back as one of our other videos about building building a house and brickwork. Look at brickwork on a house, it's strong because of the way it's built. If we just stack six on top of each other, the only piece of mat that's actually doing any work is the one on the bottom. Okay, so that'll be that. And then moving on to this, um, the transom. So we say we've got one in here, we've got the second one here as well. Um, so I've only put three layers of glass on the transom at the minute as it is, okay? So then I'm going to put two wet layers on the transom to finish the hull out. Now I'm going to weather up, I'm not going to consolidate it, okay? Then we're going to clamp 
the board against the transom, okay, the, the thickness of the wet file glass will compress and, and, and almost, well, it will glue the board to the back of the transom. Okay. So the same of these, in principle of what we've done with this, we need to increase the surface area, increase the surface tension, and increase the structural integrity of the product. So with that, you just get a Stanley knife, which oh, I've not got that behind me, it's just one over there. Okay, and then um, I've already done this side of the sheet anyway, is, is score it with a Stanley knife, okay? In, well, almost like you draw on a chessboard here, chessboard, checkerboard. Okay, so lots of diamonds or lots of squares, okay, and you'll go across the board this way, then you'll go across the board this way. The more lines, the more gouges, the more um, cuts you make into the board, the, the more you increase in the surface area of it, okay, and therefore the more you do it, the stronger it's going to be, the stronger the bond is going to be. Because even though this is timber, and timber is porous, and porous obviously you could, resin or water can soak into wood, which you're probably aware of, okay. So even if the resin soaks into the face of the board here, is it, and it's not keyed up, you know, it's not been scratched, I can still get under a corner and I can scout the whole face here, you know, I can delaminate and peel off that whole sheet of timber off of that. Now, you can still achieve that with, um, after scoring it, but it's much harder to do. Okay, so it's all about longevity um, with these products as well, okay? So we'll get them cleaned up, get them glassed in, and then we'll start looking at getting this transom bonded in and glassed in as well, and then we can move on to the next step of that. So it is Friday today here, okay, so we're gonna leave this after this is done to cure over the weekend, okay, then it's gonna give it 48 hours on top of what it's had last night to, to fully cure the process and really harden up, okay, then that's just gonna give us nice bit of rigidity in the product and then everything's going to have set nicely and then at least it gives us a nice base to move on and work forward. Okay, now moving on. File glass, the stiffening tube in, nice and solid. Okay, let's glass into the bottom after we keyed it up, laminate it in. Okay, so now we've got the transom clamped in place here. So what we did prior to this, um, which I didn't end up showing you, is I took the first sheet of ply Put a layer of file glass on top of that. So I wet the board to get the contact going. Put a piece of 600 gram uh, chopped stone mat on top of that. Then I didn't consolidate it. I put another piece of timber on top of it. And then I screwed them together in the centre. Okay. Then I clamped around the outside as well to, to basically use that to squash them together. The mat would then take out any voids because we're keeping the thickness because we've not consolidated it. And then pushing that down. Okay. So now, let that cure, bringing it in here. So we had the original transom laminate, which we had there, so we had four layers in already, okay? So we were looking at a six layer, layer up on this vessel. So I've put another two in now, wet, no consolidating again. Okay, so they've gone in wet, so you've got the thickness. They've just been gone in with a fluffy roller and wet all the mat out, so I wet the surface, wet the mat, wet the second layer of mat, wet the back of the board, okay? So then we had contact, contact, and then the filler, and then, and then clamp this in as well. Okay, so we clamped all around the outside, and then what's actually happened up at the top here, around the outside, is the thickness of the mat is compressed now, which is in squashed, and now we've got resin oozing out of all the sides, and that's what you want to see. You want to see that resin being squashed out from the outsides of the joins there, because then you know at least you're pushing the timber into the mat, into the transom, and then you're going to end up with a really nice tight bond in it. Okay, so the only other thing I'm probably going to do here just to be safe is uh, maybe look at putting a timber stiffening in off the back of this lifted eye into the bottom of the transom. I mean, solid anyway, but just as a um, caution, because we've pinned all around there, so the one thing is looking at the force of this is you don't want to clamp everything else and actually lift the bottom of the transom up. So, okay, so we're just going to put something in there just to uh, be safe anyway. And then once that cures, then we'll come in again. Um, we've got a tube carrier going on on these sides here, on both sides of the combing. And the only other thing is probably to radius this top edge, uh, just so that when the mat comes up, we don't end up with an air void channel, which will form because it's such a hard edge. We need a nice deep curvature and radius on there, so that the mat will come up and flow onto the back here. Okay, so we'll give that maybe 45 minutes to an hour. See how it's getting on, uh, just to cure that up. And then while we're doing that, we just 
we have to get this done and set before we can move on to the deck. So I've already templated the deck anyway and cut it out. It's just uh, the templates didn't quite line up where we wanted to to where it was going to sit, okay? So what will end up happening is I'll cut maybe 50 mil off the back end of the deck, which will factor in for the transom, um, and then we can look at that, okay? But before that goes in, this needs to be finished because we're going to laminate from the top here down the face another six times on top of this face, okay? Because we want to get a 50 mil transom and then again stage overlaps as we come in, okay? So that'd be like layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five. You know, and that sort of concept because then we know structurally we've got all five, five layers have got contact with the hull. That is, again, it's, it's all about building a strong foundation because the engine's on the back of here, okay? When, when it's hooked on, the engine's pushing the bottom where the prop is, that's where the torque's driving through, okay? So it's gonna work like a big lever, okay? So we need to make sure that this is nice and stiff going in. The deck will add some additional stiffening and then we'll show you about installing knees on your transom as well, just because you may have had a second hand rib or a boat and you start seeing cracking where the deck would say sit along here, you'll start seeing cracking along this edge and it's just because it's not the knees, there's no diagonal stiffeners uh, to create strength between the transom and the deck, okay, they're two individual items and what's happened is the transom's going like that because it's either over um, too much horsepower on the engine or just not enough strength in the transom for, for what the engine's trying to do. Okay, so we'll let that cure and then we'll come back to it.